The number you have reached, 911, has been changed to a non-published number. Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CLTV. Today we're going to go through our, or my favorite five posts of last week, and let's just get right to it. The first one is Public Defender, and in which Gideon uh, registers a resounding no vote to juries taking part in uh, questioning and, and the actual process of a jury trial. Um, he doesn't like the idea, doesn't think it's appropriate, and doesn't think it's their role. Kind of fall on the opposite side of that, have forever. I always thought that, you know, a jury being there within bounds, I, I think it's something where the question should probably be filtered through the judge, but within bounds should be allowed to ask questions um, and ha ask for explanations of legal points, etc. Um, next, we go to Underdog, where John's over there and he's talking about how, uh, well, he's talking about how certain uh, prosecutors puff themselves up and, you know, me, big prosecutor. And uh, he gets caught in a jurisdiction in Virginia where, well, he's in a jurisdiction in Virginia where they don't reduce anything that's got to do with DUIs. In other words, he's in a jurisdiction in Virginia. Uh, and uh, he makes the argument, it's an interesting argument, I, I don't agree with it, but it's an interesting argument. He makes the argument where he gets from the officer that the uh, PBT, he didn't write down what the amount of the PBT was, what the level was in the PBT, which for those of you who aren't lawyers and don't deal with DUIs, means a preliminary breath test. It's done at the scene uh, by a little handheld test. And then he gets the officer beyond that to admit it's been two hours, it was two hours between the time when they were on the street to when the intoxilator, intoxilatizer, whatever the heck of the name of the big machine is, when he went and used the super accurate machine, and yes, I know there are tons of arguments against that, but when he went and used the, the more accurate machine and got a .16 uh, alcohol content, blood alcohol contact, which is a mandatory jail sentence in Virginia. And he argued to the judge that, well, we don't know whether his blood alcohol content was rising are lowering during that time period because we don't know what the initial uh, preliminary breath test was on the road. It's a novel argument. I've not heard that one before. Uh, well, I've heard people argue up or down, but um, it's not really put in a way that I've seen. Uh, i got to say I disagree with it because under Virginia law, the PBT, preliminary breath test, is not admissible in court. That's why the officer didn't write it down, by the way. It's not admissible in court. It can be used to establish probable cause basically in conjunction with a series of mechanical tests, you know, like the finger thing, you know, or all that kind of stuff. Um, saying your alphabet backwards while skipping every third letter, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah, all those tests, and then uh, doing the PBT. Uh, you know, is enough to establish probable cause, at which point, if you're on the road, there's a presumption that you, you know, have to take the test, and there it invokes a whole bunch of other stuff. But uh, the thing is, the PBT is not admissible in court, and therefore it's not a matter of evidence. The PBT, and the reason it's not admissible in court, is because it's admittedly not accurate. It's accurate to a point, but it's fallible as opposed to the machine back at the you know, station, which is far more accurate and has had more, uh, is better measured and all that. So, the amount in the PBT should never have actually been, had any effect during what was going in court. It should have been only the amount when he got to the uh, station, actually took the test with the intoxilatizer to your, and I can never say that word, that the machine. So, while I think it was a novel argument, and I, I congratulate John for making it, I, I don't think it's one that should succeed. And then we get to the Matlock blog. Um, Matlock blog, he's got an article about something that anybody who's done a case as a defense attorney has seen, something they've seen, where he puts on the perfect case. His client, you know, his probation violation, She's doing what she needs to do. She's got the support of family. She's got everything going for her. 
And then she decides to testify against his advice and against what they had previously agreed to. And, uh, well, you just kind of have to read it. <laughs> it's, he's scut she does a good job of scuttling his case, that's for sure. Next we come to Of Counsel, and Of Counsel is talking about a uh, case which is ongoing where five or six affluent kids broke into 150 vehicles, cars, trucks, whatever, and stole the electronics and everything out of them for re to resell them on eBay and whatever, make money, and get caught. And Of Counsel is upset that the affluent kids got a signature bond or uh, what we would call here is personal cognizance bond. Basically, they say, well, your bond is $50,000, but you don't have to pay anything. Just sign right here. You're only liable if you don't come to court. And, you know, theoretically, in those cases, if you don't come to court, you're liable for the $50,000. i got to say, I have never, ever seen anybody um, brought to court and made to pay the, on that. It may happen somewhere, but I've just never seen it. And anyway, the... Um, of counsel is Maggie raises the issue that this could possibly be racist. And I gotta disagree with her. I think it's classist. I don't think it's racist. Now I work out in the mountains and while there are some blacks out here, African Americans and some of other ethnicities, um, not a whole lot. And I can tell you that the argument for a kid who's, you know, white, poor and and breaking into these things to support his drug habit as opposed to you know the kid who's white rich in the middle of going to college and is back on a college break you know how those results are going to turn out when you put in front of a bond, judge for a bond hearing I would expect different results I don't necessarily say that I'm happy with that and I and um, I'm not a big one for uh, making a whole lot of breaks for people because of their class but it is a reality of life um, and it's something we all have to deal with. Now, finally we get to Simple Justice. In Simple Justice, Scott has an article, a post about how, well, why those of us who actually practice law could give a hoot, to be polite about it, about most anything that's ever published in law journals. Um, I gotta say, now I read an article here, there, now, and again, but mostly it's theoretical stuff just to, you know, stimulate my brain. It has Absolutely, absolutely no application to anything that happens in court. I can't think of the last time anything out of a law review article was truly relevant. Um, and Scott goes on further to say, well, you know, the reason for this is because let's look at who's deciding what goes into law review articles, and he points the finger squarely at the fact that it's What's well, the kids? Well, and I shouldn't say kids, some of them are adults, but it's the law students who haven't had any practical experience and aren't really aiming for practical experience. They're caught up in the whole law school mania of, you know, complexity and deep issues and the minutia and all that stuff. The kind of thing that, well, most of us that got involved anyway in law school really kind of got into. And the kind of thing that people who are actually practicing in court can't get into because you don't have the time and you just aren't going to be able to do it in court. Um, maybe in a brief you can get there somewhat but you know if you're limited to a 20 page brief or 30 page brief even then you know, if you've got four issues you're not going to hit a lot of the minutia. It's just not going to happen. You're going to make your arguments as simple as possible and you, you got to make your arguments as simple as possible because you know you've got a uh, an appellate court judge who's reading 40 case, 40 you know petitions that week, and you want yours to be clear, simple, and something that he can go, oh wait, that's you know absolutely wrong, um, as opposed to something where you're relying on seven obscure cases out of Nebraska, Idaho, and Montana. Um, now the cases out of there aren't good or anything, but that's a long way from say Virginia. You know. um, to make a, a rather obscure point, which technically should give you a victory, but you know doesn't don't, just doesn't pop out of the page at anybody. And if you've ever been in a law room classroom when an actual practitioner comes in and stands there in front of the in front of the uh, students and starts getting questioned, you realize really quickly as two or three of the gunners in there start asking him 
questions about you know subtle interpretations of that that it's a different world um, and for those of you who are students let, let me kind of spell this out okay for one real good example is I think is um, lawyers will use names as shortcuts for meanings um, for instance Batson Allen is an Allen charge JEB um, Wren um, Brady um, Terry we all know what all those means but to all of us who are practitioners that basically means one sentence meaning you know like you know Batson means you cannot choose to strike a juror based on race or protected subclass which would be JEB you know for gender um, you know Allen is an Allen charge and we all know what an Allen charge is all well, practitioners know what an Allen charge is an Allen charge is an instruction given by a judge that says where he says to a jury that sold him he's hung he comes out they come out and he reads him this instruction and says basically look you need to go back and I know it's Friday and it's 4 p.m. and you want to go home you need to go back and bump heads again and figure this out because we have put this on over a seven day period of time and what makes you think that any other jurors are more likely to come up with a solution go back there and figure it out that's basically what Alan breaks down to um, Ren, you know, basically says that it means that you can do a stop on any car if there's any objective reason whatsoever. Uh, Terry, you know, pat downs, including, you know, stop on susp reasonable suspicion, pat downs. Um, and to a practitioner, that will open up all the car cases and all that stuff, too. But basically, Terry, you know, uh, Brady, you know, got to hand over exculpatory evidence. You know, all these are real simple meanings to us. Well, whereas, if I'm talking to somebody from law school who's just who might have actually read Brady within the last year, as opposed to most of us who are practicing who, you know, read Brady ten, eight, twenty years ago when we were in law school, yeah, you know, it's it's a little bit different. Um, so that's kind of why uh, I've gotten a little bit far afield. But I think if we all kind of pull that in together. It's a difference of perspective, and I will say this: uh, a buddy of mine who's uh, a professor at Center College in Economics. Uh, I went and talked to him. He, you know, he's got to get published and all that sort of thing, like professors do. Talked to him about how do you get published? Well, you submit an article, and this is basic, and I may be wrong on it, but my understanding is that you submit the article. You know, it gets looked at by whoever publishes it. Uh, it gets sent off to two other professors or people of note in the industry or some such thing who look it over and check it out to see yes this is a substantive article no this is a bunch of malarkey um, and then comes back uh, he he had used a couple of law review articles or read some law review articles and he was telling me how basically telling me how useless they were to him and how it was you know he did not understand why anybody thought it was useful in any way you have a page with, say, you know, two paragraphs, and the rest of the page be, you know, footnotes, and another page with three paragraphs, and the rest of the page be footnotes. So that's absolutely useless. It accomplishes nothing. And I think that if we were doing it something along those lines, where it was practitioners, or you know, well, practitioners or judges, um, maybe law professors that were actually going through and doing that, and were kind of um, saying yes this is useful, no this isn't useful, whatever, something along those lines um, that we might end up with more substantive articles as opposed to about 10 million uh, you know every single line having to be footnoted uh, which is not you know it's not useful it just isn't. And I'm sure that there are those out, out there who are going to tell me I'm absolutely wrong and then, you know, this law review article out here was wonderful and saved their case. Um, you know, that's kind of, it may have happened. It may happen every week. I got to say, in my, what now, eight years of practicing, wow, eight years, um, not seen it. Practicing around the Richmond area, and it's not just here because I'm in a rural area. You know, when I was practicing around Rich Richmond, they weren't reading law review articles and using them either. You, uh, they would use cases, 
and on the odd occasion you'd hear a secondary source, but it would never be a law review article, it would be something like, you know, Groot, criminal offenses and defenses in Virginia, or Bassicles, criminal procedure in Virginia, those sorts of things. It would never be anything other than that. Uh, so, maybe someday there will be useful, uh, useful law review articles, uh, rather doubt it, but, you know, I could be wrong. And on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to let it go. Uh, hope you all have enjoyed this. I uh, wish you all a happy week. Uh, at the beginning of the week, next week, I'll try to have some other video up. I don't know what I'm going to do at the beginning of next week, but you'll see when it comes up. And have a good week.